we have today with us Mr. Malik Navid Khan, who was the former Inspector General of Police of the Khyber Pakhtunkhwa region. And today is going to speak to us on the militancy and police response in Khyber Pakhtunkhwa province of Pakistan and the tribal areas. Uh, Mr. Khan has first-hand experience in this region. He has played a tremendous role in terms of uh, building on the capacity of the police, quelling the militancy in the region. And he's also looked at various interlinked issues, that is between counter-narcotics, the counter-insurgency, counter-terrorism, and more importantly, has looked at restorative justice. I wouldn't like to spend much time on the introduction, but to give you a brief overview, he sought after in a lot of international conferences and international organizations. I happened to meet him in one of the programs, that was the US South Asia Leader Engagement Program in Harvard last summer. And I met him again at the IISS NISA meet in Muscat. And his interventions on policing and the importance of uh, building on the police capacity, especially when your whole debate of counterinsurgencies revolves around the use of force and restorative justice, I think Mr. Khan will bring to the table new insights and we look forward to his presentation. So Mr. Khan, we have about 35 to 40 minutes maximum and then we look forward to a discussion on the subject. The floor is yours. Can you use this or this one? This one or this one? Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, I'm not a, a scholar or a professor. Uh, I am basically a professional police officer with 38 years of experience in the police. Uh, the last six years, uh, uh, I spent uh, three years as the commandant of the Frontier Constabulary, which was a frontline force uh, fighting the terrorists. And then the last three years as the head of the police in the Khyber Pakhtunkhwa. Before I delve on issues uh, that uh, uh, Shanti uh, referred to, I think it's important that I give you a background on, on the militancy in the KPK and uh, how the culture of that area is related and what were the problems that gave ri rise to this uh, state of affairs. Uh, the historical background, uh, gentlemen, uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, uh, this, if you see that the, this, uh, the blue line, uh, it divides Afghanistan and Pakistan, and this is known as the Duran line. Mortimer Duran divided this area uh, in haste, and uh, unfortunately, he divided the tribes, and not only the tribes, the villages, but even the homes. So the Duran line passes through homes, and therefore the British had to uh, give easement rights to both sides to move around uh, uh, on this porous border. Uh, and therefore, even now, there is no requirement of visa or any paperwork for the tribes of the Pakistan federally administered tribal areas to move into Afghanistan and for them to move into Pakistan. So, uh, uh, the FATA areas comprise of uh, uh, these seven agencies, Bajor, Mamand, Khyber, Aurakzai, Kuram, North Rajasthan Agency and South Rajasthan Agencies. The areas that you see in uh, uh, lines, these uh, were previously no-go areas uh, for the army or for the civil administration, of which I'll talk to you about in a, uh, later. The area is about 3.8 million, the, uh, the population, the area is about 27,000 square kilometers. And uh, uh, most of the areas now uh, have been uh, not really taken over. Uh, but they have been opened up and the army can move in and operate in these areas. Now, it's very important, uh, it may sound a bit naive to you uh, that in this age we talk about uh, such strong cultural values of a society, but this is what it is in, uh, in, in the Fatah of Pakistan and in the uh, Pashtun areas of Afghanistan and these are uh, inhabited by tribe, uh, tribes known as Pashtuns or Pakhtuns or Pathans or they call them who have all along been, been uh, very very fierce uh, and uh, uh, independent minded tribes who would not allow uh, except at their own uh, cost the uh, movement of foreigners, uh, foreign invading armies. So, from Alexander right down to the Mughals, when they used to cross the tribal areas, 
they used to have fierce resistance by the by these tribes and then what they used to do these invading armies they used to recruit them make them mercenaries or pay them and uh, uh, leave a contingent of what is known as hasadars uh, they were locally paid uh, nominal at that time it was quite a lot of money uh, for example in the mogul days it was 12 rupees and even now it is probably 1200 rupees but 1200 rupees is nothing now so uh, that is how they used to bribe these tribes and keep them on, on their side and the khazars used to then also uh, give them uh, uh, intelligence on what was happening and whether it was safe for them to travel through those areas or otherwise now there is a code of the pashtuns which even i as an educated man would partially adhere to because if i don't then i am not considered to be a pashtun and that is a kind of an abuse if <laughs> someone tells you that you are not a pathan uh, first of all that if any guest comes to your house you give him absolute hospitality you may go hungry but your guest has to be fed well second is that you have to take revenge unless the matter is sorted out the revenge has to be there if you don't take revenge you are not an honorable man two third is that you grant asylum to anyone who seeks asylum even if he is an enemy and he comes to you you will not touch him in your own house and that explains the refusal of mullah umar to hand over al qaeda leadership to the west or to pakistan or to anyone else because they said no they are our guests we have given them asylum we will not let them uh, 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 be handed over to anyone the tribes uh, uh, they live in uh, areas uh, the fata areas they are uh, they, they, they speak pashto in different dialects but pashto as a cultural norm it is very very strong it is not only a language it is a way of life for them and the problem here is that it's a blend of uh, a, a, a naive and a poor understanding of the religion blended with a very very strong culture of pashtun wali that has brought in this state of affairs in in some cases the pashtun wali or the cultural values they override the uh, islamic principles for example ex islam would say that you give the inheritance rights to your daughters the tribesmen would say no this is not pashto they would not say that is the islamic or not islamic they would say this is not pashto the girls will not get property and so they don't they don't get properties in in these tribal areas the terrain it is very rugged very very difficult especially for operations is very little cultivable land the plains have very little water resources and generally barren you have some forests of pine oak and wild olive the weather is extreme in the mountains you have uh, severe uh, cold um, snow uh, and uh, in summers it's very very hot especially in the plains the food is deficient and i must also tell you that the education level is so low which explains for this uh, situation today that officially uh, uh, the government figures would tell you that the, the, the female education uh, the literacy rate is 8% but it's very difficult that these statistics are skewed because it's very difficult <coughs> to send people into tribal areas to get the correct statistics so in my personal assessment it's about 2 to 3% and most of these literate ladies are living outside the tribal areas because their husbands are educated and they have left amongst the males the literacy rate they say it is 25% i would say it is not more than 12 to 13% and most of these educated people are having jobs in the settled areas so what you are left with people in the fata poor uneducated illiterate taught by uh, illiterate molvis who give them a, an incorrect perception of the religion and some of them because of poverty are contaminated by these terrorist groups uh, they are bought over and they then contaminate the minds of the little, little children in some of the madrasas not all now how did the britishers uh, rule these tribes they never set up a police uh, force in the tribal areas there is no police force even now what they did was instead of appointing commissioners and deputy commissioners in fata they appointed political agents 
the political agent had lot of powers he was the chief judge he was the chief uh, commissioner he was the chief collector he was the chief policeman and he was the chief of the locally uh, deployed armed forces so he was all powerful but by treaties with the tribes the tribes ensured that they keep their independence in a way that their local matters will have to be solved by themselves so if a, a, a crime would uh, take place on a government road or a government building only then the political agent would take action against the tribe or the individual whereas uh, if there was a uh, dispute between the tribes or within the tribe the tribe would sit in a jirga they call it it's a, it's a group of people they sit on the floor there is no leader there is no mullah there uh, to interpret islam and they decided according to the code of pashtun wali it used to be a very very fair system but then as i talked to you later on it got corrupted because of the heroin and the gun culture and and the, of course the corruption in the government departments so they used to administer them the british through these political agents and kept the uh, tribes specified so that they would don't one number one they don't want or don't wage war against the british and secondly to keep the supply routes clear in case they had to move against the russians uh the threat from the russians was always there the tribal administration had political administration the political agent and his staff then you see the second most important component was the elders or the maliks this maliki system was used the malik uh, title was conferred on people they used to call them uh, the white bearded people the people with wisdom so uh, and they were honorable people they were represent without voting they they represented the people so they would sit together and sort things out if there was a dispute between the government and the jirga a grand jirga used to be uh, called in and that used to uh, under the political agent it used to settle the matter uh, then for ensuring uh, compliance of the jir- decisions of the jirga there was a three tier system first was hasadars that i talked to you about low paid but uh, sort of semi government functionaries levies government functionaries given a rifle and nominal salary they are still there and then finally the frontier corps it was a paramilitary it is a paramilitary force and uh, initially if there was uh, a dispute uh, or a tribe became errant the khazadars would be told to influence their tribe to behave if they won't then the levies would be told and as a punishment they would be sent home so the livelihood would be, would be blocked and then finally if they won't agree the frontier core would be called in to take action and in case which was very rare the frontier core failed then the army used to be called in uh, the, the the sole system was governed under a frontier crime regulation uh, which is known as rewaj uh, of 1901 this was the act passed by the british and one of the most important uh, issues was uh, collective territorial and vicarious responsibility the british designed laws for them where there is no question of vicarious liability but when they designed laws for us section 107 i stand guarantee for your good behavior in this case the tribe used to be responsible for the action of the individual the tribe used to be responsible for um, surrendering the, the criminal to the people so there was a graduated system of response with increasing severity a jirga was requisition then individual action was taken then collective responsibility and multiple arrests used to take place and then economic blockade they used to physically and literally block the area and not allow any uh, uh, food items or petrol or electricity or whatever very little electricity at that time and finally as i said the uh, uh, military action so it was a blend of uh, the fcr was a blend of the tribal customary laws uh, with some uh, uh, of these british uh, interventions uh, which they uh, improved now let's talk of pakistan after 1979 the whole world the non communist world they joined hands and uh, resisted the russia's invasion of afghanistan jihad was made a basis of the afghan resistance by design 
it was encouraged by the West, which was supposed to be secular, but they encouraged it in our part of the world. They said this is the only force which can fight uh, uh, communists uh, because you tell them they are they don't believe in God and they occupied a, a Muslim country and everyone rose, especially these tribal people. And uh, as a result, there was a massive influx. At one time, we had about four million of our refugees, and they used to live with us, just like our like like our own citizens. There was hardly any ethnic problem, hardly any uh, uh, tension between the two uh, communities. Uh, in Iran, they were sequestered into uh, camps and they used to deposit their weapons on, on the border. But here they used to bring in their weapons and they used to live within the community. There were camps for them, but there was no restriction on them to work or to live outside the camp. So even now, if you go to Peshawar or to Karachi or wherever, you will see thousands of Afghans in shops, in the service sector, in businesses, as taxi drivers. So even now we have about uh, 2.5 to 3 million Afghans living in different parts of uh, Pakistan. But what happened was that in the uh, Afghan war, the elite class of uh, uh, Afghanistan, they abandoned Afghanistan and the leadership uh, uh, then uh, went to the religious uh, segments of the society uh, versus the tribal leaders. Then there was impact of Arabs and foreigners. They were deliberately brought in. Uh, they were given different identities and brought in to fight the uh, uh, Russians. The influence of narco trade, uh, the massive weapons, weapons funds uh, into, into and through the tribal areas so what happened was that FATA was exposed to new social forces and the, uh, the, the, the Maliks, the elders who were uh, very honorable people, they were replaced by people of shady character, the, the people who had earned money through, through drugs and uh, weapon smuggling and they, in the Jirgas, they used to be influenced and therefore the judicial system in the tribal areas, it almost collapsed and there was a vacuum uh, which could not be very easily filled, which was later filled on, filled in by the Taliban because they promised and they did deliver quick and speedy justice in the tribal areas initially and then in Malakand. In 9-11, the 9-11 attack happened, the war in terror, Pakistan joined, joined the uh, war the army moved into Fata. Now when the army moves in, then the, 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 the scope for political dialogue is reduced to a minimum. People who were jihadis who had driven the, the Russians out of Afghanistan, who had broken the back of the communist empire, they felt very bad at us the Pakistanis and at the West for having abandoned them. And they turned against the state because of uh, America's uh, occupation of America and ISAF NATO forces in Afghanistan. They say that when Afghanistan has fever, the tribal areas of Pakistan start sneezing. And when these tribal areas sneeze, they're effects are, are felt in the in tribal areas of Pakistan. So, unless there is peace in Afghanistan, our tribal areas will, will not be uh, at peace. And if the tribal areas are not at peace, the uh, settled areas will always have uh, problems. The spillover into the Pakhtunkhwa districts, the settled areas was very obvious and we had start, start, started these attacks, suicide attacks and uh, uh, improvised explosive devices. The geostrategic strategic location of Pakistan is very important. Just go through this slide to show you its proximity to different areas, to Central Asia, to China, to uh, Middle East, and then to most importantly the Persian Gulf and Arabian Sea. So this is a saying of Dr. Alama Iqbal uh, which is uh, so very correct. He says, Asia is a form 
cast of water and clay, in that form, the Afghan nation is the heart. If it is chaotic, all Asia is chaotic. If it opens, all Asia opens. If the heart is free, so shall the body be. Else the body is a straw in the path of the wind. Now what are the other strategic factors that make Pakistan very important? First of all, it's a Muslim, the only Muslim nuclear state, one of the five or six nuclear states in the world. It has a large and a very, very efficient professional <coughs> army. Then there's a very strong nexus between Pakistan and China, very, very close friends. India's discomfort is obvious. Israeli fears Pakistan because it's a Muslim state. Uh, Russia, now that uh, uh, it has been defeated, yet it is licking its wounds and is, is waiting to become an uh, economic power again because of its size and its resources and time probably will tell how <coughs> they manage. Now let's come to militancy in Khyber Pakhtunkhwa, Pakistan. These are the tribal areas in yellow. In light brown you have these districts of the KPK. Uh, the Malakan division, which was most affected by the, which was actually taken over by the Taliban, is shown in red. These districts, except for one or two uh, in Kohistan, Batagram and uh, Abbottabad uh, and Haripur, the rest of these districts were all affected by way of uh, attacks by suicide. Uh, suicide bombers and IEDs and uh, sniper shootings. Could you tell us the difference between Pata and Fata? Pata is provincially administrative tribal areas and Fata is federally administrative tribal areas. In Pata, some of the Pakistani laws apply. In Fata, the only the FC FCR applies. So that is the difference. The causes of militancy, of course, uh, uh, the uh, originally the uh, uh, Al Qaeda's grand design of Islamic Emirates of Afghanistan. So uh, when they were in Afghanistan, they actually uh, were at that time uh, uh, planning to design a, a, a state for themselves from where they could launch their attacks, from where they could launch their biological attacks, even dirty bombs and all that stuff. Uh, and uh, at one stage they were considering Islamic Emirates of Afghanistan and then later on, uh, right up to 2005-06, they were planning to have the Islamic Emirates of Waziristan. Uh, the 9-11 and war on terror, the porous borders and the spillover effect into the tribal areas. And then of course, most importantly, the uh, internal factors, they are very, very important. The existing administrative system was set aside in the tribal areas when the army moved in. The Maliki system or the tribal norms and traditions were totally disregarded. There were operational difficulties in that during when the army moves in, it moves in like it moves into a, an enemy territory. It is not like police. It's very difficult for them to distinguish between the good guys and the bad guys. So while when they, when they go for the bad guys, uh, the good guys also suffer and they turn against the state. This is a very important factor which has to be kept in mind when you're dealing with terrorists. Some of the madrasas were infiltrated and not all, as I said earlier. And then there was, there was no clear-cut strategy because it was very difficult because there was a period when these Taliban used to hold courts and they used to dispense justice, fast just quick, uh, prompt justice, uh, without any ex uh, expense, and it was fair. So the people thrown to their courts. But then what happened was when they saw this power, they wanted to occupy and rule and that is where they erred and that is where they became brutal and we have videos of policemen being butchered and beheaded and their heads placed on their chests and my, while I was IG this happened with my force we were using two, losing 200 policemen every year two of my, one of my brothers was a deputy commissioner he was killed in a suicide blast one of my uh, additional inspector general uh, head of the uh, elite force, 
He was killed in a blast. Several superintendents of police, DIGs. We lost three DIGs. I mean, it's very rare uh, for a police force. The, the, the number of casualties that we suffered, I think, is the highest uh, ever recorded in the history of any police force. So, but we had constraints of manpower, resources, equipment, and most importantly, the, the forces were demoralized. In Malakan, we 70% of the force went home. The 30% they were they were housed in the police stations, unable to come out. It was difficult even to send them rations. And the Taliban used to send letters to their houses to and warn their parents to give in the press that I have disowned my son uh, because he is he has refused to leave the police. And this had a tremendous effect because because of the mobile phone, they used to send messages to people. And then one message to another and sort of communication was so easy within the society that they actually terrorized the entire society. No one was willing, was willing to give information. The police was weak. The army was not at that time allowed to take action. And of course, lack of education, uh, lack of uh, uh, criminal justice system in, 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 in the Malakan division, which was basically uh, responsible. The composition of the militants, there are Pakistani Taliban, Al-Qaeda operatives, now they have been reduced to, to, to a very limited number. Some have been killed, the leaders, and the, most of the others have uh, uh, reportedly shifted to Somalia and now are probably working in Libya uh, and Yemen. Then there are the jihadis that I talked about. And the general religious zealots and sympathizers of, of Taliban uh, who do not have a clear understanding of what these people are up to. Unfortunately, the local groups and gangs, criminals and smugglers, they also joined them. And this was a, uh, this was a, uh, a strategy by the criminals to gain support of the Taliban uh, and have power and at the same time use their resources to uh, commit crimes like kidnapping for ransom and make money for themselves and also to uh, give financial support to the Taliban movement. So it was a two-edged sword and that is how your kidnapping for ransom, they rose to a phenomenal uh, uh, high in, in that time. And then these were the, there was the Afghan Taliban. Now the Afghan Taliban are, uh, are actually the genuine Taliban. Most of the Pakistani Taliban are spiritual groups. They uh, have, they have, they tacitly or openly uh, uh, claim to have support of the Afghan Taliban. Some are getting their support, uh, but uh, generally they are using the Afghan Taliban name to 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 sort of. Uh, uh, to meet their own uh, agenda. The strategy of the militants was to demonize the LEAs, a belief that national identity is at stake, and a belief that the West wants extermination of our race. Foreign culture and values are viewed with scorn and revulsion, and they uh, issued fatwas, religious fatwas, uh, declaring certain things as un-Islamic. And then there was politics of religious and sectarian differences that was uh, fanned. Uh, like if the Shia sect had a demonstration, uh, some group of Taliban would send suicide bombers and kill 20, 30, 50 uh, members of the Shia sect. And that then gave rise to further tensions in the, uh, in the society. <coughs> The, the tactics obviously were to target schools, barbers, barbers because they used to shave the beards and they said shaving of beard is un-Islamic. Music shops, music is haram, don't listen to music. No, Islam never says that. There was no music at that time. NGOs, net cafes, they used to be blasted with improvised uh, devices and they challenged the right of the government. They, 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 they used to establish a parallel criminal justice system that I referred to, like quick, prompt uh, disposal of cases. They attacked the law enforcement agencies, army installations. 
even in my hometown of Kohat, every week in the 2006, 7, 8, uh, we used to have seven or eight uh, missiles coming in from the tribal areas into, into the cantonment every day. And several people used to get killed. They used to kidnap government servants and then ask the government to, uh, to release their uh, associates uh, for uh, the government servants. But uh, in, in the event they weren't released, then they would slaughter these government servants and throw them into the uh, ravines near the settled areas. They used to hijack government vehicles and use them for their own operations. Rocket attacks, suicide bombing culture started. So there was a general threat to security, safety and economy of the country and they had actually held the entire society uh, as hostage. Now how did the militants used to uh, occupy space, space? In the early uh, 2002, 3, 4, uh, they used to go into a society just as very peaceful religious uh, uh, preachers sit in a mosque or a madrasa with the beads in their hands and they used to start uh, settling disputes and they would tell them we don't go to the courts, don't go to the police, come to us, we settle your disputes and they used to do it in a very orderly and a very very effective manner and they used to do it just because they had no uh, linkage with either of the groups. Their aim was to uh, infiltrate the society. But once one of the groups would uh, not like their verdict, then they would take out arms and go into their house and then threaten them and tell them that if they call the police, uh, they would be butchered. And they used to butcher people and uh, let his body rot on the streets and no one could dare call the police. So this is how they used to terrorize the society. They tried to paralyze the government by cutting the main routes, damage bridges, electrical installations eliminate government royals, destroy state symbols. And they used to act where there was minimal government control, where there was very little police, where there was far-flung areas, villages. And they were very effective uh, propagandists, very, very effective propagandists. They, they used the internet, they used the mobile phones, they used the uh, CDs. And then, of course, they uh, excelled in the art of uh, indoctrination. Uh, like Kari Hossain, I was talking about uh, to the other group the other day. Uh, he said that you, you give me a non-Muslim, and not that I'll convert him into a Muslim of his brand, of course, but you would convert him into a suicide bomber in three months. He started running short courses for suicide bombers, 24 days. But then he said you have to use him within 24 to 48 hours, otherwise then he will change his mind. And then, of course, the tunneling te techniques, Osama bin Laden, his family was in the construction business and he had this, this keen interest in tunneling which he used in Afghanistan in Tora Bora and he was also planning, this was my intelligence, uh, uh, to, uh, to have a tunnel city in the Wakhan corridor which, which is uh, in, 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 uh, which is at the border of three, four countries, Russia, India, China, Pakistan and Kyrgyzstan also, one of these countries. And we saw those tunnels, it's unbelievable. Kilometers long tunnels with an excellent system of uh, uh, air ducts, with operation theaters, with media rooms, with ammunition dumps. And you wouldn't know which way leads to which side. And the entry to these tunnels was so difficult to find out that unless someone came out and fired from there, he would not know that there was a tunnel. So it was very, very difficult. Here are some of the numbers of militants uh, that were killed uh, in police encounters. 150 in 2008, 2009, 138, 2010, 94, 2011 up till the month of September, uh, 56. Now these were the some of the Seizures that the police made in uh, uh, 7, 8, 9, 10 and 11. Uh, the others are very relevant also, but in 2008 you will see this figure of uh, explosive materials. 52,366 kilograms of explosive materials were seized. And the seizures, mind you ladies and gentlemen, 
amount only to 10 or 15 percent of the actual uh, stuff which is uh, circulating in the uh, market. Uh, and out of this 52,000, you could make hundreds of IEDs and hundreds of suicide jackets. And the kind of weapons, rocket launchers, anti-tank mines, dynamite, detonators, mortars, bombs, you name anything and it's there. Police, we lost 108 people in 2007, 232 injured, 167 in 2008, 318 injured, in 2009 the highest, 201 uh, killed, 452 injured, and then in 2010 and 11, 99 and 115. So you see the number of people and these injuries in red, they are not ordinary injuries, they are they're totally incapacitated. Now, what happened? Now we come to the police uh, side. Firstly, police was totally demoralized. The people were totally uh, shocked and taken hostage. Uh, public was not mobilized. So we came up with a three-pound pound strategy. This was developed by me, discussed with the politicians, and I said we have to, we have to sensitize the people to the enormity of the problem because it was a totally new thing for us. It had never happened before. So, my first interview with the New York Times was, uh, was came in the, in the, on the front page and it said, uh, uh, Peshawar uh, will be overrun by the terrorists. And, uh, but I had qualified it, I said, if proper measures are not taken, this and that. And there was a hue and cry, and the politicians shouted, and they said, the, the, the job of the police chief is to give a sense of security, this chief is uh, uh, scaring us. And so then I called all these MPAs, and they stated about 130, 40 of them, and I gave them a presentation, but before the presentation, I made them see the videos, and they couldn't see the videos. About a dozen of them walked away, they, they felt sick and they couldn't see the video, they were so gory. And then I told them, I said, please wake up. You have to wake up, it's a province, you don't have the resources, you have to go to the highest level, to the president, to the prime minister, get resources, get whatever you can, get federal forces, and we have to save our cities because they will be moving. And they did try to move in, from Malakand they came to Bonaire and then they sort of <coughs> so our first thing was to sensitize the people, then to mobilize public. We have this tradition of having uh, 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 public, uh, uh, police public joint anti-crime organizations. They were, they were, they had gone into disuse for about 30, 40 years, but then I revived them. I told them, I said, police is very thin on the ground. You have to go now. People in the frontier province are all, they all have weapons and most of them, and they are all trained in uh, uh, the use of weapons. So we organized them, and uh, we, uh, in every village, 40, 50 of the people used to guard at night, along with the police. And there were several ca casualties among the public people. So that gave a message to the Taliban that the people are not with you and they are against you. I personally used to go and tell my DIGs and SPs to speak to the people and tell them that this is a curse, this is a cancer, if it gets into your society, it will never come out again and uh, you will be the sufferers. So this is how people realized and then the public was mobilized. Capacity building, most important was of course the morale building of the force which uh, was, was at a very, very low edge. In Malakan, we had a meeting with the Prime Minister and he said the army's action is on but we would like to withdraw the army immediately and tell me what measures we can take. So two things I mentioned to him which were immediately approved. One was I said you set up a community police force from comprising of people from 
the terror affected areas don't go for physical fitness just go for for youth in these areas and ask the local public representatives to give us the best of the lot who can defend them and uh, so there's a lot of discussion whether this is possible or not possible but i told them that this will convey to the people that the government is with them and they are they are, they are going to invest in the people secondly it will send a message to the taliban and to the militants that the people have joined this force and therefore they are not uh, with them uh, thirdly it's a confidence building measure and most importantly uh, it will give you the critical mass of intelligence and so that was approved and uh, uh, but but it did a tremendous job the police and the army jointly we trained this force in one month one and a half month training they were on the ground and performing so well that they gave us excellent information and they used to go because they were the people who had been harmed by the militants so there was an element of revenge in them and uh, uh, we also inducted 2500 uh, ex army men because the average age of the policemen in malaga was very low because a lot of policemen had been inducted in the in the last 4 5 years uh, new new sanctions were uh, uh, given uh, so when these people came in they firstly provided them with uh, some uh, sense of uh, sort of their average age increased then uh, the army since it was trained in security and safety measures uh, they were they were trained in and 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 it helped the police to gain some morale and we started having uh, the retired the, the people who had gone home they started returning to the uh, police peace committees and lashkars that I, we call them lashkars are groups of people who are formed to counter militants or criminals so that i have talked about then we set up these musaliti committees this was the this rate of justice concept which is inherent in our culture that we decide uh, uh, cases before we go to the police or the courts to settle disputes of of minor nature or even of major nature if the parties agree and this has been a of a tremendous success it was uh, picked up by the asia foundation they funded us and now it's operative in about 20 districts this model is now being uh, asked for by the afghan government and the punjab government has also followed us now uh, our, near a uh, neighbor province and uh, uh, this comprises of uh, the best of the people in the community uh, belonging to different professions retired government servants businessmen religious leaders but who are spotless and the only people we have kept out is the politicians no politician and this is talked about a lot that why have you i said if i have taken one from the government party that i have to take one from, from the opposition and then it will all be politics so let's keep the politics out and it worked very well in some of the districts the politicians tried to come in but that then it became uh, problematic so uh, we started giving uh, a quota to uh, the relatives of the policemen especially to those who had sacrificed their lives and uh, to the brothers and the, the brother in laws of the policemen who had died so that the family was sort of associated with uh, the morale of the force we started giving gallantry medals uh, for bravery to the civilians who used to help the police and it's okay we set up some specialized units like elite force project coordination unit directorate of counter terrorism we set up a strategic planning unit planning unit and we also had these heavy weapons uh, uh, purchased for the police and set up a directorate of welfare and morale affairs as well these are some of the uh, uh, morale boosting measures uh, like the governor and chief minister guarantee awards increase in pay and allowances revamping of welfare activities insurance policies quotas out of turn promotions special tdas and police persons who suffered physical psychological trauma and fight against militancy were sent for religious uh, uh, trips to uh, saudi arabia the martyrs package was raised from 
1.5 million to 3 million rupees and we gave them plots. We already, when I was there, we had allotted 500 plots to the uh, families of the martyrs. And we named the police stations after the martyrs in their own villages. And we, we erected memorials in the name of the martyrs also. <coughs> this is the last slide. Uh, I call it, sorry. The war on terror has to be contained. Capacity of law enforcement agencies has to be brought to a critical level. Training, infrastructure development. And this third point is very important. If you, the, the terrorism is a very, very strange phenomenon. The police, it's not the job of the police to deal with terrorists. It's not the job of the army to deal with terrorists. If you use the army for a long time, you politicize the, the army. If you use the police force against terrorists, you militarize the police force. So for both it is very uh, uh, not advisable. So I suggested for a counterinsurgency and stabilization force to be set up. Alternate dispute resolution forums are very important so that the people have immediate and free justice. Economic development. In America they had core of conservation core of 1.5 million people in the 30s depression. Even if you have one Fifth of these in those affected areas, I think things, things will improve. Che rules and protocols have to uh, be changed and out-of-box solutions found for fast-track assistance and development because the normal uh, routine is very, very slow and we cannot wait. We have to try to bridge the gulf between different religions, communities, particularly in the West. And an emergency has to be declared for the prevention of radicalization in all vulnerable areas and institutions. And a dedicated and well-funded program for rehab and de-radicalization is absolutely crucial. Criminal justice has to be improved. The more we sweat in peace, the less we bleed in war. I thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Khan, for a very incisive and in-depth presentation. And this has been based on a first-hand experience. Uh, before I open the floor for discussion, I just have a few points which maybe would actually gear in the discussion to understanding the nature of the militancy. Given your own uh, ethnographic and demographic experience in the tribal areas, could you tell us more, a little bit more on the nature of the militancy per se? You actually associated the Afghan Taliban and the Pakistani Taliban, but there are a lot more other groups which have come in. Uh, that exactly brings me to the point of the nature of the society now in this part of the world, which we don't really understand. Uh, you talked about the traditional systems there, the Pashtunwali code and the Malaki system. But we also understand that decades of conflict, the systems have broken down and they have been replaced by very radical elements. Uh, we have the Salafi influence. So in that case, is there a tension between the radical and the traditional? And if there is a tension, then how do you bridge that? And that leads me to the second question of the economy per se. You mentioned a lot about the drugs and the smuggling and the weapons which are existing in the region. Uh, what is the kind of the economy which can actually replace this kind of a network which funds the militancy in a lot of ways? Is there a counter in terms of building on an economy which is based on traditional systems there? Or is it completely out of reach and just flushing money into the region is not helping? And the third area is also to look at the nature of the police um, in the area which is functional in some sense, but it doesn't give us a sense of the nature of the recruitment of the police. Police is primary in terms of counterinsurgency, and you're right when you're talking about building on the restorative justice systems and setting up these committees. These are innovative ideas. But what in terms of human intelligence gathering, what kind of network exists between the people and the police? Or do you think police has to be sidelined and replaced by a counterinsurgency and stabilization force, which could actually lead to a situation of having many forces but not really looking at the issue at hand? These are a few questions which I'd like, maybe in later on in the discussion, but now I would like to open the floor for discussion. And I'm sure there are many questions on this kind of topic. Uh, thank you, Mr. Khan, for, for an excellent exposition. You uh, started very well by saying that uh, you speak from, from, uh, from your own personal experience. Uh, this is a region, uh, my name is Iftakhar Chaudhary, by the way, I'm uh, from ISAS, uh, uh, Bangladeshi, but uh, I was one of the few East Pakistanis those days, uh, one of the three, as a matter of fact, to have served in the frontier government, uh, though in settled uh, areas. But those days, 
we didn't have the problems that we speak of now, but much of the culture that uh, 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 she's just spoken of still existed. We had drugs, uh, 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 there were problems of weapons, uh, 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 there were problems of kidnapping, those cultures uh, uh, were very much prevalent. Uh, we, administration was not difficult, in fact it was fairly easy, it was far easier in the frontier than in the Punjab for instance. Uh, we had the advantage of course of martial law, uh, which doesn't mean a military rule only, it means a, as a, uh, uh, this is for the rest of the audience, a set of regulations uh, alongside uh, uh, criminal procedure code and penal code. Uh, usually a counterpart regulation, for example, police we had 54, you could uh, arrest anyone for, for suspicious movement. Uh, there was a martial law counterpart which was 109 I think those days which meant which was non-bailable so it was to the advantage of the magistrate he could determine or she could determine whether bail is to be given or not. So administration was fairly easy. But the problems of weapons, those days weapons were produced in Dara Khel for instance and everyone carried a gun though even in settled areas. So all these uh, weapons that you are speaking of now, I mean where do they come from? Where do they procure these weapons from? What are the sources? Secondly, Mixed with this Taliban counterinsurgency, is there a burgeoning, a growing f uh, sense among the tribal uh, 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 Pushtunwali tribal culture that there is an encroachment on this culture by the settled culture? And so part of it is also resistance to that. It is not just uh, uh, Taliban and, and militancy, it's also the fact that, you know. Uh, uh, the Fata culture, those days we didn't have Fata, uh, the tribal areas. Tribal culture uh, is being penetrated by the culture of the settled areas. And this is what they are resisting to. Would that be a fact? Well, let's refer back to the 70s. It is not only in the 70s after Pakistan, but even before that, uh, in. Uh, it's, uh, I feel it hard to say. But uh, for a Pakhtun uh, to take away his gun from him yeah. is like taking away his wife. Sure. Or probably it is worse. Yeah. People used to have weapons. We have weapons. There were licensed weapons and unlicensed weapons. The, but the weapons were simple, either single barrel or double barrel weapons, or 7mm, or 8mm, or 0.22 rifles. They were single shot, and they were used by people for their own defense, because it was generally a very volatile society. You had tribal areas all around. Uh, if you remember the history of Shapkadar and Bada Forts, the British built them, because of, there used to be tribal incursions, and they used to come into the cities. So there was a policy of that everyone should be armed, and even now, Despite all the martial laws, people are armed. The problem uh, with, the, with this uh, um, uh, Russian invasion was that a single barrel uh, gun or a, um, uh, this thing, a weapon or a pistol was replaced <coughs> by a plastic ball and by a bazooka and by a mortar and by an anti-aircraft gun. All these came in to Afghanistan from Egypt and from Israel and from America and from you name any country and from Pakistan also to fight the Russians. That is still available there. One. Secondly, America spends fifty billion dollars on on its anti drug program. And you go to the Washington Square in New York and these drugs are sold on the street. Open. Wherever there is demand, there will be supply. Wherever there is money, good will be. So it's very difficult. These gun smugglers, they have, they, 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 you, you give them money, it's, it's a question of paying them off. And you get them in Singapore, you can get them in Malaysia, you can get them in America. But the problem is that after uh, 79, the, the rule of law became very relaxed in Pakistan. Because you could see these gun talking of arms going around with weapons and they gave liberty to the Pakistanis also to behave the same way. And they used to sell their weapons to every now and then. It was a question of pride to have a Klashnikov. My sons would tell me, Dad, get me a Klashnikov. 
It was so common, I mean, 20,000 rupees you could get it very cash to come. Even now it's available, maybe for 60, 70,000. So, when, where there is demand, there will be supply. Now, the supply is mostly the old Russian states. It's not the government that are involved, it's the private sector that is involved. The money, money is generated now from your uh, this two, three billion dollar uh, poppy that is grown in uh, Afghanistan, of which the street value in the West is over 40 billion dollars. So part of that money is definitely going into this uh, this thing, and I think there are groups which are which want this volatile situation to continue so that they benefit. So you don't compare it with those times. Secondly, in those times when you were the, uh, in the administration, the administration was very fair and honest. Unfortunately, with other things deteriorating, the level of honesty dropped to a very, very low and investment low, especially in the tribal areas because there was no accountability. There were slush funds with the political agent. The political agent would set up any barrier anywhere he wanted and start collecting even now, when these the trucks go into the tribal areas, it was in the High Court that someone came up and said, why are they charging us this money? And they said, oh, the High Court jurisdiction does not <laughs> apply in the tribal area. And he's collecting billions of rupees. Now, what are they collecting these billions of rupees for? No, it's meant to pacify the tribe. So it's a very serious issue, and it has not been continuing. I mean, it's sort of a recent phenomenon. This used to be done uh, during the British days also, <coughs> but I think the dispensation or the or the uh, expenditure of this money was probably judicious and uh, transparent, uh, and and with this dishonesty and corruption, I think uh, the the the, 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 the up processes and the traditional mode of delivering justice and harmony in the society that has been very badly affected. So I think that is the about the sense of uh, uh, encroachment, the tribesmen actually are, uh, uh, they find themselves between the devil and the deep sea. On the one side, they were fed up with the Taliban. On the other side, when the army came in, their own own Dirga system was replaced, and, and they're, they're a very independent minded people. You stop them after every four miles and tell them, raise your hand. I mean, it's unbelievable. A settled area man would, would agree to these things, but it's death for them to stop them in their own area and then subject them to physical checks. And then they have their families with them. And their families are exposed to, to alien men in uniform who don't speak their own language. Because most of the army is from another province, the majority province, obviously. You don't have any. So there's a question of this. Then you have this issue of the American drones and, the, and this element of revenge in, in the society. If a drone hits uh, a house where they have given refuge to uh, an Al-Qaeda man or a Taliban, Talib leader, uh, they will never forgive this revenge. The subtribe will rise against and they will go to a war time and kill a few Americans and then come back. And that creates this thing. So I think uh, uh, both, they, 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 they were not, obviously they are uh, as much resentful of the Taliban as are they resentful for the army, but then they have no choice. And now they are trying to build up these areas. And as I say, the, uh, uh, unless you uh, give them proper uh, economic incentives, Things will not improve. Um, the Crocker, who is now ambassador in Pakistan, he was ambassador in Pakistan, and he had come to my office for a presentation. And I told him we are spending billions and billions of dollars on this war effort and innovation. I said, in America, in the depression, you set up this conservation force of 1.5 million people paying him $20 a month and who were responsible for the beltways in America and for this conservation because they you know, planted these trees and that is why America is so green today. I said if you uh, 
do this on a minor scale in the private areas, it will only cost you less than a billion dollars per year. I said, how is it? I said, hundred dollars per person. We pick him up, give him a card of recognition, send him to another part of the country to work. They would pay him a couple of thousand rupees and you pay him the hundred dollars. The total bill was seven hundred million dollars. And I said, with this you can employ you know, over a period of four or five years, 50, 50, uh, 300,000 men, which would represent one in 10, which is the family size. So every family would have one man employed. And it would create liquidity in the market. And they will be the people who will be loyal to you, because this is what has happened all this time. They will become your customers and your lovely ladies. And he said, oh, have you talked to your president about this? <laughs> but it was, it was talked about a lot by the USAID and by other agencies. Uh, even the Congress, they picked it up. I was told when I visited that area. Uh, but, uh, about, the, about the intelligence, I think people have now woken up and they, they inform the police now. There's this lot of uh, this thing. But the problem is that uh, there is no police in the settled area, in the tribal areas. And there's not as much of uh, uh, sort of uh, interaction between the army and the uh, population in the tribal areas. Uh, because obviously army is army, they don't feel very, they're not very free in interaction with the, uh, with the public. They're, they're not trained to be you know, interacting with the public. So. Uh, but in, in the tribal areas, the intelligence they do give, but there's a very heavy price that they are paying. Anyone who's found to be giving intelligence is he's, he's killed by the, by the Taliban. Since we're running short of time, let's take a last set of questions. So, yeah. so, yeah, for myself, just a couple of questions. You said that some and not all madrasas have been infiltrated, Talibanized, or radicalized, whatever is the word. What does it mean and how did this happen? How are the good madrasas as different from bad madrasas? And secondly, also there is this issue of good terrorists and bad terrorists, uh, accusation against Pakistan in the international forum. What is your experience uh, in your area of population? Let's take a set of questions. Prof. Uh, in your uh, efforts to contain uh, militancy insurgency, did you run into any problem with your army? Why I'm saying that? Because uh, there are certain sections of the Taliban group which enjoyed the patronage of the army, which for one reason or another. Uh, did you run into some of their men and, you know, the kind of uh, clash or conflict? Uh, in, the, in, the, in your presentation, uh, I mean, you were absolutely correct that the Russians, the Americans, and others have Initiated the whole system, but the Pakistani state as it is, in the good old days, never really tried to apply any of the corrective measures. I mean, they did not even try to penetrate these areas, uh, which were totally out of the bound for the state, uh, and, and, and was accepted. Now, uh, before 79, from 47, if the state had taken any concerted measures to develop these areas, and most of these states, I mean, India does it in, neglects its own tribal areas. It, it's not uh, particularly typical to Pakistan. But if it would have done that, you would have had a very different situation. Mamta? Mr. Khan, I'm very curious to know, how do women from these tribes, how, where and how do they feature in this process, both ends of the process, like from the police side, are they also recruited as human resource within the community uh, police building force, and also maybe on the other side, are they more vulnerable to be recruited as suicide bombers by the radical elements? So how do they feature? Thank you. Yeah, I just uh, wanted to follow up on some of the points that have already been raised. Uh, following up to question, I, I think the, the system that you described, uh, what you developed uh, in, the, in the Fanta area, in fact, the British had developed it all across the Indian frontiers, from Baluchistan to Northern Burma, uh, the system of a loose governance uh, beyond where you had a controlled territory. Uh, that was quite convenient for the British, and it was resource efficient. Low cost. Yeah, low cost. Now, when when the independent countries took over, 
and then proclaimed sovereignty on these areas, uh, which were loosely governed before, but not extended sovereignty. I think India has the same problem in the Northeast. But there are also actually agencies within embedded within India, for example, in many forest areas, actually, where Naxalite uh, thing has grown, largely a uh, similar problem. <coughs> but the, there is a philosophical question that says, do you try and preserve the culture of these places? Or do you say, look, uh, they must become eventually citizens of the Republic? With all it means in a modern sense, uh, the state's authority must be extended, as well as civil rights, individual rights must be extended. Now, that dilemma in terms of looking at it in the long term, uh, do we say, look, okay, now only how many, there are not too many people, uh, we have the same problem where we have restrictions of movement of private capital, ownership of territory. Are you going to preserve them as museum pieces uh, and then let it actually you know, go to, get to seed uh, by neglect? Or do you say, look, no, we take full responsibility. The states must take full responsibility. Extend modernization, state control, individual rights. I think, uh, is that debate at all uh, taking place in Pakistan? The second question which uh, Surya pointed to uh, that the Pakistani state policy that it, it wants to fight those who are fighting the state. And clearly, these are the sections of the Pakistan the Taliban who fight the state. But at the ground level, when you differentiate between uh, friendly, say, those who you know, Afghan Taliban, which Pakistan has had uh, different reasons of support, uh, and the Pakistani Taliban, which is fighting the Pakistani state, I mean, how does it affect you on the ground? In the policing system, does the state policy of differentiating between different groups, does it affect you? The final last question. Just out of time. Okay. The culture of these places and then the insurgency, the current round of insurgency, does it also have to do with the culture of these places being changed deliberately with the influx of the Salafi kind of Islam from Saudi Arabia? Madras House. Actually, the uh, uh, in the some countries, unfortunately, have had a very uh, uh, strong influence uh, over madrasas, and there have been funding uh, of these madrasas, uh, <coughs> probably for their own uh, sort of uh, designs. But uh, I have done some research on these madrasas. Uh, generally, they are there because of our uh, lack of proper educational facilities. People do not have the money to feed their children or to clothe them, and they send them to these institutions so that they are fed, and then they believe that they will learn the Islamic, go uh, through the Islamic education, and land up as Maulvis or somewhere. But in some cases, uh, uh, some teachers, maybe 1%, 0.5% of them, they were sort of uh, of the uh, extremist mind. And they started influencing some children here and there. Uh, we did a survey, and there were very few people from the madrasas actually who were uh, uh, suicide bombers or the jihadis. They were ordinary people. They were not, not from the madrasas. It was very surprising for us, even. Uh, but definitely, even in ordinary schools, in Peshawar, there was a school where there was a teacher, and he would identify uh, uh, students, uh, vulnerable students, and pick up those and then take them out of the school and in um, uh, the garb of giving them tuition, they used to indoctrinate them. So this is about madrasas. Army's problem, and then this will cover a couple of other uh, things. There have been mistakes, uh, of course, but I think mostly they were mistakes uh, of our doing and of course of the global situation of this uh, fighting for others kind of thing that we uh, went for. Uh, we should have adopted an independent policy we should not. Unfortunately, we had an uh, army general at that time. There were politicians who are now ruling the KPK government who at that time used to say, for God's sake, don't fight for America. Uh, just just be independent. Don't do that. And at that time, they were said, no, you are, you are uh, anti-Pakistan. You see? So they, these were mistakes uh, committed. About the jihadis, pro-government and anti-government. The only difference is that, that there are jihadis who, from Kashmir, go into India, or used to go, now I think the number has reduced quite a bit because of the fencing and because of the policies of both the government and some talks going on, whatever. But they used to go and uh, uh, 
conduct sabotage activities or fight the Indian forces and come back into this part of the Kashmir. Now, that probably is what is referred to as good Taliban, because they never bothered the Pakistan government. We are fighting with the Taliban who are creating a problem for us in Pakistan. And they are within our own society. They are in the tribal areas. And they hit us and they go across and hit the Americans and the Afghan National Army also. So, uh, it's not a question of good or bad Taliban. For us, they are, they are the same. People who, who, who uh, harm us, we, we, we go for them, you see. Uh, women in tribal areas, it's, it's a very, very, I think, uh, a sensitive uh, question because the, the plight of the women in tribal areas is very, very deplorable. Uh, the literacy rate, as I told you, it's, 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 it's abysmally low. Uh, they have hardly any representation in the government. One old woman, I, the only woman I saw in my life was one woman. She was a doctor, a wazir woman who was a, a tribe. I'll give you a very uh, interesting story. Uh, the uh, Senate Reappropriation Committee, U.S., they had come uh, for a briefing because they were giving a summit, so they had come in to see how things were happening. And uh, I told them, uh, the chairman, I said, uh, Madam, the, uh, the people of the tribal areas are living in the 17th century. So you have to realize, you, you don't interact with them like they are, they are the citizens and they are living in the 21st century. So two of my uh, VIGs who were actually, one was Wazir and one was Masood tribesman, they raised their hands and they just, he said, so the general said that we were living in the 17th century. We belong to that area. Actually, we are living in the 13th century. So, mm. women's rights is something, something, something very, very rare. And uh, police, we advertised, I, I, I tried to increase it to, it is not even 1 or 2 percent the police um, ratio of men to women. It's not because we don't recruit, they don't join the police force. They, do, they, they can't work with the men. It's, it's a problem. It's a social cultural problem. We, we don't stop them. We advertise it several times, and uh, they, they, they don't want to join the police. It's very really unfortunate. Uh, tribal areas, we don't want to uh, keep them as uh, uh, museum pieces. <coughs> there have been several attempts at reform. Definitely, Pakistan government is to blame because we have not paid due attention to that area. We have not been able to exploit it economically and to develop it economically and to bring about education there because of uh, several reasons that we referred to before. But it was not by, by, by design. It was just, just because of the uh, lack of vision of, of the people at that time. Uh, they thought, oh, this is very safe. Because it was safe at that time. There was no problem. But then you, they should have had the vision to see 20, 30 years hence and, uh, so what will happen to an un uneducated people. How will they be compatible with the rest of the country? I think this was a very big mistake that, uh, that did take place. There are changes now taking place, but you, the problem is that in a war going on, in a situation of flux, you, you can't bring in reform. Reform will, will, will work only in a, in, a, in a relatively stable <coughs> environment. If you bring in 10,000 different laws of human rights and, and civil rights and liberties and political freedom. If you can't implement them on the ground, if you, if you can't go and speak, if you speak, you're killed. If you're, if you're moving, you're, you can't hold a, uh, a demonstration, you can't. I mean, it's not, uh, uh, it's not so easy. Uh, they are now bringing in reform because now they have brought it under the judicial review of the High Court. So they are, they're, they're, they've brought in reform. I think gradually, it, it will gradually happen. Previously, there was no presentation in the assemblies. It was during Bhutto's time that he brought in um, uh, the members of the National Assembly from the tribal areas. And now we are planning to have them in the assemblies of Khyber Pakhtunkha. So it will take a gradual, gradually it will, it will take place. Uh, and uh, about the Salafi, uh, I think, yes, uh, overall, uh, there has been some influence, but I think now uh, their, their days are, uh, those days are gone uh, because I think the, the amount of harm that the, the Taliban movement has done to 
to fundamentalism in, in, in the religion, uh, I think uh, the, the, the doors are closed for this kind of activity. And the, the people in Pakistan and the environment, I think, will, will not allow extremism. It is gradually being, uh, being sort of uh, uh, liberated from these kinds of religious <coughs> constraints. Uh, because I remember when I was uh, SP or DIG, uh, it was very difficult for us because of public reaction to go and raid a mosque. Even if we had information that there, there was some criminal hiding or whatever, and uh, or to uh, or to read a madrasa because of, there was to a public hue and cry, oh, madrasa, sacred place. Not that they were supporting terrorists. Or the, there was no terrorism at that time. Now it's different. Now you go in and people just uh, don't bother about it. So there's a, there's a very very big change that has taken place, and I think it's because of the brutalities and these. Uh, uh, misadventures of the Taliban that have brought about the scene in the society. And I think there's some moderation uh, coming in. Well, thank you, Mr. Khan, for a very incisive and in-depth presentation, and mainly based from a practitioner point of view. Uh, on behalf of my colleagues at ISIS, I'd like to give you a token of appreciation for having taken time and come here for a talk. So. This is